Okay, if not, well then let's begin. This is ECEN 5004, Environmental Signal Processing, lecture number three. And uh, there's going to be a lot of material that we pull out of various sources. And this is one example of that. I talked a little bit earlier about a textbook called Numerical Recipes. Sounds like a funny name. It's a really great book. It's one of the better references to have on your shelf for any kind of numerical analysis. So uh, I have various excerpts of it on the D2L site for you to read. And in particular, I want you to take a look at those for this lecture. But I also would suggest, uh, it's not a very expensive book. I, th I think it's uh, around $40 or so, $50 perhaps. You'd find it to be a really good reference to have in your shelf. Begin this numerical recipes. Last time we also asked whether we would like to make this a flipped classroom or not. The traditional classroom is what we're doing right now. That is, we use the class time for lecture with slides available before the lecture and video afterwards for review. Or we could possibly review our lectures using the previous uh, year, actually the fall of 2013, the previous year's video lectures. And you would be responsible for viewing those lectures the evening before. And then we would reserve our class time for open discussion. That's the flipped classroom concept. We can do either of the above, and I asked if you would let me know your preference, the results of the poll are in. And here's the poll. It's, a, it's almost a tie. So uh, in favor, we have one in, strongly in favor of traditional. Actually, this is strongly in favor of traditional. This is moderately in favor of traditional. This is moderately in favor of flipped and strongly in favor of flipped. And so these are the numbers down here. And in, in many regards, it's a tie. We have a number of people who are leaning towards flipped, but they're only leaning towards it. There's one, only one that's definite. Uh, we have a few people who are definitely traditional, and only one that's leaning, uh, actually two that are leaning toward it. So what I decided to do is apply weights, much consistent with this course from the standpoint of interpreting data. Because in some sense, what we're trying to do by this poll is take a measure of what the prevailing opinion is. And so if we assign weights, a one being leaning in one direction or another, or in a two being definitely in favor of one direction or another, what we then can do is come up with a measure for how many people would like the traditional and how many people would like the flipped classroom. And it turns out in this case that we have eight in one direction and eight in another. So the average of that effectively becomes no significant conclusion, unfortunately. But that's an example of how one uses data. So what I'm going to suggest is that we use then the, the default format, which is the traditional format, unless we have any strong opinions one way or another. So let's just continue doing that for right now. That's our measure, in other words, of what the class's opinion is. Last time we talked about Gaussian random variables. We went over a number of aspects of Gaussian random variables. Univariate Gaussian, bivariate Gaussian, multivariate Gaussian. We went over the characteristic function. We talked about Iserlees theorem as well. And this was really a review, so nothing should be too surprising there. But we went over, again, these concepts in enough mathematical detail so we can use the concept of the Gaussian random variable in the course. We also talked about system noise and bias. And hopefully, we've given ourselves a, a little bit clearer of a picture of what we mean by noise and, in particular, bias. What we want to do today is move into model-based parameter identification. So we'll talk about least squares error fitting least square error fitting, I should say, or LSE. Pseudo inversion, which is a way of taking a model that you set up and data and coming up with the optimal coefficients for that model. We'll talk about the design matrix and the normal equations. The chi-squared quantity, which is extremely important in any kind of 
fitting any kind of model-based parameter identification. Singular value decomposition. And if we have some time, we'll get to nonlinear and conjugate gradient methods. Uh, we may just pick these up next time, though. We use curve fitting in a lot of ways. In fact, this graph that I showed you earlier, this is a plot, I should say, of raw data and model data. The model data is illustrated by these black lines. Is one example of how you come up with a best fit model to observe data. So this will happen a lot of times in the use of real data. I just want to review two last time the all-important uh, covariance matrix, and just to remind you of how we calculated it. In some sense, the covariance matrix itself is an estimate. A lot of the times in this course when we think about use of data, it's going to be in estimating quantities, whether it's parameters of a model, or in this case, nine numbers that define the statistical quantities needed to determine for you the statistics of a random variable. And we were able to calculate that covariance in literally just one line of code. But it also brings to mind another issue. I, I wanted to, before I go to this issue, I wanted to show you a little bit more about how we calculate this covariance from the data matrix to make sure everybody's comfortable with that. The data matrix in this problem consists of 500 random vectors. Each of these random vectors has three entries to it. So we look at this as a three tall by 500 wide matrix. That's what we call our data matrix. And you can see that one little line of code over here gives you the estimate of the covariance from that data matrix. I wanted to expand this little line here graphically and show you a little bit more about what we mean. So what I've done is I've showed you a little more uh, in detail what that single line of code is doing in estimating the covariance matrix. Back up a minute. There's the line. It's just x times x transpose divided by n minus 1. Here's x. It's got 500 columns, and it's got three rows. Each of these columns is, in other words, a sample data vector. Here's the n minus 1 out front. That just scales everything. And here's x transpose. Now, when you take the matrix, the data matrix x, and you transpose it, you're flipping it on its side. So we end up with a matrix that has 500 rows and three columns, same data. We're multiplying that by x itself. And you can see that what we're doing is taking each one of these columns, I like to think of it as laying that vector down, laying it over this vector, multiplying each of the pairs of numbers, and adding them up. That's the easiest way to think about matrix multiplication. And what that does for us is it gives us nine numbers. And those nine numbers are illustrated by these sums. The first of those numbers in the upper left corner of our matrix is it gotten by taking again this, overlaying it on that, multiplying the pairs, adding them all up. And that turns out to be the sum over all values, or I should say over all uh, sample vectors, out to n of them, of x sub 1n squared. And you can see that all of the other various products as well, the other h products in that matrix, are all going to be obtained by taking these various column vectors, turning them on their side, multiplying them pairwise against the elements of another row vector here, and adding them all up. And they're going to give you these sums in the result. That result is indeed a 3 by 3 matrix. And if we think of what these sums are, they truly are indeed the covariances of the various elements. This is the covariance of element number one against itself, or in other words, what we would just call the variance of x sub 1. 
This is the variance of x sub 2, variance of x sub 3. Again, remind you that we're dividing by n minus 1 here to get those. These off-diagonal terms are the covariances of those elements. They're a measure of how closely x1 and x2, or x1 and x3, or x2 and x3, how closely they vary according to each other. That gives us our entire covariance matrix estimate. And I do want to point out to you that I'm using little hats on top here to indicate that these are really covariance estimates. They're not the true covariance, necessarily. But with 500 numbers, that starts to become a pretty good measure of getting the true covariance. We'll talk about the accuracy of these estimates as we go along a little bit later in the course. I just wanted to make sure, though, that everybody was comfortable with the MATLAB math we used to take a data matrix and turn it into a covariance matrix. Now, before we go on, I do want to point out one thing. The random data that we used here in this little example was zero mean. This function rand n gives us random numbers, pseudo-random numbers to be sure, pseudo-random because this is a computer generating these numbers, that are zero mean. If I didn't have zero mean data to work with, if the x data, in other words, was shifted by some mean vector, what I would first want to do before I used it in this kind of a covariance estimator is subtract off the mean. So the first thing you'd do is you'd find the mean over all columns, subtract that mean off from each of the columns, then you could use the result in this particular single line of code to get the covariance. So that's fairly important, but that's actually just not more than one more additional line of MATLAB code to do that. Now, one more thing I want to point out. Let me back up a bit here. Uh, here's our covariance matrix estimate. It's a 3x3 three three matrix. What do we expect this covariance to be? If this is really a set of random vectors, 500 of them, each three-dimensional, what would we expect the covariance to look like, especially given that these are indeed normal random variables? What would be the expectation here? Between 0 and 1. Exactly. Exactly. You'd in fact expect that the covariance matrix would be a diagonal matrix with values of 1 along the diagonal. That's pretty close to what we get here. Note it's not exactly what we get, because if you look here, this is not quite the same shade of red as that. They're all hovering about 1 on the diagonal, but not quite. And if you look off diagonal, they're all hovering about 0, but they're not exactly 0. Why aren't they exactly 1 and 0? Because of errors. Because of errors. It's because we're estimating the covariance. We've only got 500 vectors to do it with. If we had a million of them, 10 million of them, this matrix would become closer and closer to a diagonal matrix. But it's not quite. So that's what you get when you work with real data you get estimates of quantities like the covariance matrix. Now, a lot of people would look at that and say, gee, that's a great estimate. I can use it for various purposes. I can use it for all kinds of statistical calculations. And some people would be satisfied with looking at it like that. But other people would say, well, wait a minute. If it's not quite a diagonal matrix, then maybe what I ought to be looking at is the difference between it and a diagonal matrix. And this leads to something that we'll oftentimes think about in the course, which is not so much the answer, but how the answer differs from what you expect. And here is exactly that. It's the difference between that same covariance matrix estimate that we just came up with and the diagonal matrix, which has ones on its diagonal. It's also blown up, so you see a little bit more of that error. This is something that we call the innovations in signal processing. It's the difference between what you've got and what you expect. And that innovation is something that's worthwhile practicing, always thinking about. 
because that's what's really interesting in the use of data. It's not so much what the data is or what it becomes when you do a calculation, but it's how that calculation differ from what you expect. We'll talk about the innovations a lot in this course and how they are important in lots of different areas of signal processing. But anyway, here are the innovations for that little example we studied last time. Now, with that as a little more background from the last lecture, let's continue on and talk about model-based parameter identification. Now, um, what we're going to talk about first are what we call linear models. And linear models aren't necessarily lines that go through your data. Rather, they are models such that the data that you have is related to some set of abscissa points through a linear set of coefficients, multiply, I should say a linear product of coefficients times what we call basis functions. So we're going to assume that we have a set of data, x sub i and y sub i, where i goes from 1 to n. We'll always think of n as being the number of data points we have, and x is the abscissa, y is the ordinate. And we're going to allow ourselves now to come up with a model where we have m unknown model parameters. This number n, this number m, keep those in mind. We'll think about those a lot. If we set this up, we can imagine sort of a simplistic case where we have what we call a polynomial model. This is what, generally speaking, people start out thinking about when they do data fitting in high school, uh, the linear model, for example. That's a polynomial with only two coefficients in it. But in general, we can come up with a polynomial that has an arbitrary number of basis functions in it. In this case, the basis function for this first coefficient is literally just 1. The basis function for the next one is x. The basis function for the next term is x squared etc., all the way out to x to the m minus 1. And again, m is the number of model parameters that we're seeking to determine using the data. That's what we would call a polynomial model. There's no reason we have to use x, x squared, x cubed, etc., as our basis functions. We could choose to use sine x and maybe an x cubed, we could choose Bessel functions for our basis functions. We could choose lots and lots, in other words, of what we call transcendental functions for the basis functions. And that would be something we would call a transcendental model. Again, it's a linear model in the sense that all of these transcendental functions are simply weighted by coefficients to give you the actual model that you seek to determine the coefficients of. And we can do other things as well. We can choose integral differential models, where our data, in other words, are related to coefficients multiplying integrals of some function of our data, our abscissa values, or perhaps coefficients multiplying derivatives. So there are lots of ways we could set up models that are linear in this form where we want to find the coefficients that best fit the data at hand. Now, why would we want to choose one over another? It really depends upon what you think your data is supposed to do. If you don't have any good model at all for it, sometimes the polynomial is best, especially out to, say, cubic, maybe quartic. Beyond that, it really is kind of a guess as to whether your data truly follows a polynomial of degree 5 or 6 or 7. Sometimes it's better to really start thinking about the physics of the data at hand at that point. But there are lots and lots of cases where you might have a Bessel function buried in the data as well. If we're talking about diffraction patterns in, in optical data, for example, oftentimes Bessel functions come up. So without belaboring what you choose for the model, let's think about how we go about finding these coefficients.
One way to do this is to set up the data using the so-called design matrix method. Set up the data and the unknown coefficients and, in fact, an equation to get those unknown coefficients, unknown coefficients using the design matrix method. And I'll show you how to do that with a polynomial model. Here's our polynomial model right here. And what we want to do is make sure that we fit the model to the data at all the data points. And one statement of that is as follows. And that is that we make sure that the polynomial y evaluated at all xi values is equal to the yi values. In other words, this holds for all i. That's rather simple. You're literally just plugging in your x values, making sure that at those values, this polynomial evaluates to the yi values, force-fitting the polynomial to the data, in other words. And that will give you the following set of equations. We can put these in matrix form, and we'll find out that we have a matrix over here, which will have ones in the first column, your various x values in the second column, your various values of x squared in the third column, etc., etc., and then finally your various values of x to the m minus 1 in the last column. That matrix then, if you multiply by a column vector of your unknown coefficients, a1 through am, that'll have to be equal then to all of the y values, y1 through yn. That's force-fitting the model to the data. And this matrix A, we call in this case the design matrix. Now the real question becomes, how do you find your vector little a of coefficients from this design matrix? That will depend upon the number of data points you have, as well as whether these x values are repeated or not. So just hold that question in your mind for a moment. Because what I want to show you next is how you do that using least squares error. If you've got more data than you have parameters, what we can do is we can set up what we call an error function, a square error function, E. And this is going to be the sum over all data points of the yi minus the y of xi given the vector of coefficients a. That's called a square error function. And to determine what the vector of coefficients is, what we can do is we can minimize this error function. We can differentiate it with respect to each of the various a coefficients, set that derivative equal to 0 for all j. j goes from 1 through m. And this will give us m equations in m unknowns. These are known as the normal equations. Let's take a look at how we do that. Here's our polynomial model. Here's our square error. And what I've done here is simply plugged in our polynomial model, evaluated it at the x sub i. I just made a essentially an expansion of this expression. You're still squaring the error. And now we're going to minimize this error by differentiating. We're going to take the derivative of that error with respect to all of the various aj, set it equal to 0, do this for j going from 1 to m, and just repeated what we're going to do here. And what you here see now is the derivative set equal to 0. There's the 0 on one side, and here's the derivative. We get that by doing the following. I'm just going to back up one slide real quick. You can see here, if you differentiate this expression, you're bringing down a 2, you're bringing down an outside a minus sign, and then you're differentiating with respect to one of these various coefficients. That'll bring out an additional xi to some particular power. That's exactly what we've got there. Here's the xi to the j minus 1th power. There's the minus sign, the 2. We're setting that equal to 0. 
And you can cancel off the minus 2, and you can multiply through this xi to the j minus 1 term by term in here, and you can rearrange this to look like the following. On the left-hand side, we've got the sum over all data of our coefficients multiplying powers of x sub i. The lowest power is the j minus 1th power. The highest one is the m plus j minus 2th power. And on the right-hand side, what we've got is the sum of y sub i times x sub i to the j minus 1th power. So this is simple algebra at this point. But what these are are really m equations. And we call these the m normal equations. And this looks a little bit like a mess, quite frankly. So you might want to try to clean it up. And the best way to clean these things up is to put them into matrix form. Matrices are great ways of organizing numbers or equations. And if you think about it, those m normal equations now give us the following matrix equation. Over here, I've got a matrix, and it consists of sums from 1 to n of various powers of x sub i, all the way up to x sub i to the twice m minus 1. Over here, I've got a column vector of unknown quantities. These are my unknown parameters, and there are, are m of them. And over on the right-hand side, I've got a sum over all of my data points of y sub i times all the various powers of x sub i. And it starts to look like something that you can fathom and actually set up in MATLAB and very easily invert. And in fact, it is invertible, provided that n is greater than or equal to m. In other words, provided you've got enough data to handle all of the unknown parameters in the problem. And one more provision, at least m of the x sub i are distinct. If you have duplicated values of x sub i, then you might end up not being able to invert that. But the inverse is really easy to do. Here's our set of normal equations in matrix form. And I could take this matrix on the left over here, which really is just the sum of all powers of x sub i, and I could call that matrix alpha. And what I've got now is a matrix equation alpha times little a is equal to beta. The inverse of that, the solution to the problem, is little a vector is equal to just alpha inverse beta. Alpha inverse provided, again, that n is greater than m, and you've got at least m distinct x sub i. That's easy to do. That's literally one line of code in MATLAB. So the key here is setting up the normal equations. This works, by the way, not just for polynomials, but it works for, as we'll see a little bit later, any kind of linear model problem. These basis functions don't have to be x, x squared, x cubed, etc. They could be transcendental functions as well. And this is still easy to set up and perform. This takes us beyond just straight line curve fitting and allows us to fit polynomials now to data sets. Let's get back to the design matrix for a moment, though. I presented that first slide about the design matrix for a reason. The design matrix was a force fit of the model to the data with n equations. And you might ask, what's the relationship between the least squares normal equation method and the design matrix? And I want you to note something. Alpha, in the previous slide, just happens to be a transpose times A, A being the design matrix. Now, maybe that's not too obvious, so let me go back a few slides. Here's our design matrix. This is where we force-fitted the model to the data. There are n equations. There are m unknowns. A was what we called this design matrix. 
Now let's go back forward again. I want you to note that alpha in the previous slide, where we set up the normal equations, it is literally equal to A transpose times A. You can prove that to yourself real easily. No, not hard to do. Here's A, the design matrix. If you take A, transpose it, multiply it by itself, you will get exactly this matrix alpha. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that the normal equations are really the following. The left-hand side, where we had an alpha A, is really the design matrix A transpose times A. And the right-hand side, let's pay attention to that for a moment. If Y is our vector of measured ordinate values, Back up one more slide. We note that the normal equations over here have a vector that we're calling beta, which is yi times sum of uh, what times 1. Uh, then we have a sum of yi times xi, sum of yi times xi squared, etc. That vector beta is also written rather simply in terms of the design matrix as the design matrix transpose times y. And again, I'd ask you to look at the design matrix, convince yourself of that. It's not hard to see. For polynomials here. Sorry? Only for polynomials. Only for polynomials thus far, right. Talking about polynomials, yep. Yep. So, we see that the normal equations are really the following expressions. And if you want to find what parameters to choose for your model, what you can now do is the following. You can take the product of A transpose times A and invert that, multiply it on the left-hand side. Uh, I should say left multiply it on the right-hand side of the equation. Here it is. And you end up with your estimate of the parameters of your model. So the design matrix itself is buried in least squares estimation and very simply, too. This inverse here, where we take a design matrix, we transpose it, multiply it by the data, and then we take it, transpose it, multiply it by itself, invert it. That's known as the pseudo-inverse of the design matrix. Pseudo-inverse. It's not quite an in inverse, because the design matrix itself, when you force fit the data to your model, or your model to the data, rather. There's no guarantee that that design matrix is going to be invertible. But when you multiply this by the transpose, when you multiply this transpose here, invert those, that pseudo-inverse will give you the least squares fit. So here's the pseudo-inverse to give you our parameter vector. A transpose A inverse, A transpose. This is worth memorizing. There are not that many equations in this course that I'm going to suggest are worth memorizing. I'm going to suggest there are probably something like maybe a dozen of them or so. This is one of them. Matrix A transpose A is positive, definite, and symmetric, and thus invertible. Provided that the row rank of A is greater than or equal to M. This is a condition, in other words. Provided that you have enough linearly independent rows in your design matrix, which has to do with really sampling at enough different X values. And again, provided that that row rank is greater than the number of unknowns, you're guaranteed to be able to compute the pseudo-inverse. In other words, you're guaranteed to be able to find your coefficients for least squares polynomial fit. A needs to have at least m linearly independent rows, in other words. Now, I'm not going to prove that, uh, but that is something that is a basic element of linear algebra. And I'm just going to ask you to accept that. This is a really handy little technique. 
We can go there even quicker, by the way. If you recall, this was the expression that we used to force fit the model to the data. Here we have our design matrix. Here we have our unknown coefficients. Here we have what would be our measured values. If you then take this and you left multiply by A transpose, and then provided that A transpose A is invertible, you can see how the pseudo inverse comes about. It really is based upon force fitting data in some regards. Now there's a relationship of least square error curve fitting to something called maximum likelihood estimation. We're going to talk about maximum likelihood estimation in a lot more detail later in the course. So I don't want to dwell on it now. And so the next few slides I want to go over somewhat quickly. Please bear with me. Don't like to go over things quickly. But I do just want to point out that least squares error fitting has a lot of undercurrents in a lot of the things we're going to do in the course, and one of them is relationship to maximum likelihood estimation. What's maximum likelihood estimation? Well, I want you to consider the following. Consider the model fit. In other words, consider your process of getting the best set of A coefficients as an estimator of some unknown data that you're trying to get at. I should say, let me rephrase this, the model fit really, which is your, your polynomial, is an estimator of the raw data. That, that's actually what I want to say here. And your estimator of the data, y estimate, is equal to the true data plus some random error. True data is what you measure. Random error is the difference between that data that you measure and your, your model data. And I want you to assume for a moment that the errors in your fit are independent of the value i, and they're uniform and randomly distributed Gaussian variables. In other words, the probability of this little error term, the probability distribution of it, is Gaussian and it goes as essentially e to the minus the error squared over some uh, variance, twice some variance. And now consider the log likelihood function, which is the logarithm of the probability distribution for y given a parameter vector a. This log likelihood distribution, we're going to talk about this a lot more a little bit later in the course, but I want to give you a little bit of a prelude to this relationship between these, these different uh, uh, ideas, these different concepts. The log of this probability distribution of the data given the parameter vector is something we want to take a look at. In fact, we can figure out what that log likelihood function is by first looking at the probability of yi given a. Now, the probability of your model vector given a parameter vector is really just the probability of probability distribution of your error vector. And so this can be written as a Gaussian function e to the minus yi hat minus yi squared over twice sigma squared. Or in other words, it's the same as the error probability distribution function. And for all xi, then n of these xi values, what we have, since these errors are assumed to be independent of each other, we've got a probability distribution for our yi which is going to be Gaussian, and it's going to go as e to the minus the sum, i going from 1 to n, of yi minus the actual data, as the measured data, that is, squared over twice sigma squared. 
And therefore, the log of that probability distribu distribu distribution function, in other words, the log likelihood function, as we would call it, is the following. If you take this function and take the logarithm of it, what we got here is a product of one term and another. Whenever you take the logarithm of a product, you get the logarithm of one term plus the logarithm of the other. The logarithm of this exponential is this sum right here. The logarithm of the term in front becomes just another constant here. And when you maximize this log likelihood function, in other words, produce what we call the maximum likelihood estimator, what you end up doing is minimizing the least squares error. Because here we did, indeed, we see a sum from 1 to n of yi model minus yi squared. If you come up with the parameter vector a that maximizes this function, because of this minus sign over here, it's actually minimizing that function. So I just want to leave you with the notion that the least square error fit, which we get by, for example, pseudo-inversion, that's actually the maximum likelihood estimate of the data, provided that the errors are, can be considered Gaussian independently random variables, independently distributed random variables. So I don't want to dwell on that too much, and we're going to talk about maximum likelihood a little bit later in the course. But I just wanted to point out that least squares error has a lot of undercurrents with a lot of other concepts in the course. Let's get back to more mundane issues. Let's say you didn't feel that your data satisfied a polynomial relationship. Maybe your data, for example, really looked like it was oscillating. Or maybe the physics behind your measurements suggested that the data was oscillating or following a Bessel function or some other basis function. How do we handle now the arbitrary basis function? Well, here's the polynomial model. y of xi is the sum over m terms of your coefficients aj times xi to the j minus 1. In this case, the basis function, capital X sub j, we think of as just powers of x sub i. That's the polynomial model. But you could have these basis functions, again, be sines, cosines, exponentials, transcendental functions, lots of different functions. Let's assume that to be the case. In which case, maybe we decide our data ought to fit a model which is, again, linear, but it's a set of coefficients multiplying these more arbitrary transcendental basis functions. This still easily leads to a general form of a design matrix for any basis function set. All you've got to do is force fit the model to the data, and you'll end up with now a design matrix A, which is going to be your various functions that you've picked evaluated at all of the various abscissa points. This capital X1, it could be a sine. Capital X2 could be a cosine. X3 could be an exponential. Xm could be a Bessel function. You can still very easily construct this design matrix by literally evaluating those basis functions at your various abscissa points. Easily done. And you end up with a matrix over here, A. That's your design matrix now. Not for the polynomial necessarily, but it's just as easily computable. Let's take an example. Let's let one of our basis functions be the sine of xi and another basis function be an exponential of xi. In this case, our value m is equal to 2. We have two unknowns to the problem. Our y of xi is just a1 one unknown coefficient times sine xi plus a2, another unknown coefficient, times e to the xi. The design matrix in this case is nothing more than sine of x1, sine of x2, sine of x3, etc., etc. In this column, 
e to the x1, e to the x2, e to the x3, e to the xn, etc. Very simple to compute. Simple as if you had a polynomial, really. Might take a few more operations because uh, sine and exponential are transcendental functions. And generally speaking, uh, in modern computing, uh, those operations require a little bit more in the uh, uh, floating point operations, a little bit uh, larger number of floating point operations than would x squared or x cubed, etc. But usually not much more. Um, by the way, uh, if, you, if you did this, you could take this matrix A. I'm going to back up a few slides. You would go right back into this equation. You'd compute A transpose A. You'd also compute A transpose. Very simple, just flipping the matrix on its side. You can then compute the pseudo inverse, multiply this all out, and get your vector of unknown coefficients very, very easily. So what we talked about really for the polynomial model is very easily extendable to any kind of transcendental model as well. To be sure, these are all still linear models, but very easily extendable. Now, I'm going to get to an actual MATLAB example using this in a minute or two. But let me first talk about one more thing, and that's weighted least squares. Many times in measurement, you might get a data set, xi, yi, where you trust some of those measured values of y more than others. How do you handle that? How do you put a weight on some of those? Rather simple. You do so by constructing an error function. That's the sum over all of your points of your data minus your model squared. But you divide through by a number sigma i, which is your estimate of how accurately each one of those y i's was measured. The sigma i, in other words, is the measurement error standard deviation. What you're effectively doing is saying some of those n points are more valuable than others, possibly. Of course, if you've got a measurement system whereby all n points were measured with the same error, no problem. Sigma i is the same for all values of i. You could just bring it right out of that sum. and you've got really the same problem as before. But in this case, this allows your sigma i to vary from point to point. How does that work into the problem? Very simply, it turns out. The design matrix, which could consist of transcendental functions or polynomial functions either way, is simply modified by dividing through by sigma i. So before, where we had capital X1 evaluated all the Xn points, now it's capital X1, but it's divided by sigma 1, then divided by sigma 2, divided by sigma 3, etc. And the B vector on the right-hand side, this now becomes not just Y1, Y2, Y3, but it's Y1 over sigma 1, Y2 over sigma 2, etc. You're weighting these values accordingly. The inversion to get the optimal set of A values is very simple. Here's the pseudo inversion. It's simply the design matrix suitably modified by these weights. Transpose times itself, inverted, times the design matrix transpose, times B, which is also a vector of observations that have been weighted accordingly. It's actually a pretty complex problem now that we've worked ourselves up into being able to solve in one line of code. You're given a set of data, x, i, y, i. They might fit a linear but transcendental model of an arbitrary number of coefficients multiplying these transcendental functions. And you might trust data 
from one particular value of i more than another, there's the optimal solution. It's no more complex, really, than what we started out talking about, simple polynomial uh, modeling, simple least squares inversion for polynomials. And in fact, is the least squares solution as well. I hope everybody sees the power in this approach. A lot more powerful than just fitting lines to data. This function we just defined, whoop, let me back up one slide, uh, where I was. This function we just defined has a name, too. It's called chi-squared. Of course, it's written as the Greek letter chi-squared. But everybody knows it as chi-squared. Chi-squared is exactly that. It is the weighted square error metric. In fact, we could write chi-squared as being equal to the sum from 1 to n of an error for each point squared. n is what we call the number of degrees of freedom in the distribution. And when I speak about distribution, what I really mean to speak about is the distribution of this number. Anytime you do any kind of fitting, you can come up with a value of chi-squared. You can compute it. When you're done, for example, and you found your, your vector of A coefficients, you can take your measured data, subtract your model using your A coefficients you found. You can scale it by the errors. You can compute this term, and you'll get a number. But you can also ask yourself, a priori, what should be the distribution of that number? How should it be statistically distributed? Well, chi-squared is really the sum of a number of zero mean normally distributed random variables squared. If you've got a good fit, that is. If you have gotten a model that reasonably well fits the data, in other words, if your data truly is sinusoidal, if you've chosen a sinusoidal model, not chosen a bad model, but a, a good model, and if you've gotten estimates of this measurement error that are, are reasonable, then every one of those terms in that sum is going to be a normally distributed random variable. I say normally distributed. I'm assuming that the noise in the problem is Gaussian. And what you've got then is chi-squared being a sum over n normally distributed independent random variables squared. The average value of each one of these is 0, and the variance of each one of these terms, uh, each one of these error uh, e sub i's, is 1. So you can now ask the question, what would be the probability distribution function for this sum of n independently distributed random variables squared? And the answer is, it follows this distribution. The probability distribution function for the statistic chi-squared, chi we, we think of chi-squared as a statistic, as a function of, of x, is equal to x to the n over 2 minus 1, e to the minus x over 2. That's a very, very well-known form. I'll show you the plots of it in the next slide. But it's worthwhile to think about what the statistics of this statistic are. The average value of chi-squared, the expected value of it, if you've got a good model fit, is just going to be n. You can figure that out if you, for example, determine what is the mean of x given this distribution. I don't ask you to do that, but if you wanted to, you'd integrate this distribution times x from 0 to infinity. Chi-squared is a positive number, clearly, so you integrate from 0 to infinity. And you'll find out that that answer becomes n. You can also find out what the variance of this chi-squared statistic is. There's chi-squared. Again, it's a, think of it as a, a, a random variable. 
If you take it minus its mean and then look at it, what its expectation is, and again, I'm not asking you to do this, but if you wanted to do you could set up the integral to do it, you'll find out that it equals 2n. This function over here, by the way, the gamma function uh, down in the denominator, uh, is just uh, such that gamma of n plus 1 is equal to n factorial. Now, with this notion that the expected value of chi squared is n, and its variance is twice n, let's take a look at some plots of the distribution function for chi squared. Here's our chi squared variable, as it's always defined, always, in this course, and in probably 99.9% .9 of the world's mathematical literature, it's defined that way. Here's our distribution function for chi squared, given the number of what we call degrees of freedom. And this number of degrees of freedom, I, I mentioned on the last slide it was n, but I really have to modify that a little bit here. It's n minus m because you have m coefficients that you're adjusting to have your model fit the data. So we have to uh, reduce the number of degrees of freedom slightly. But here are the various plots of the distribution function of chi-squared given different numbers of degrees of freedom. If you have, for example, a problem where you're taking, let's say, 25 data points and you have five unknown parameters in your model, you would end up with a new of 20. 25 minus 5 is 20. In this case, the probability distribution for chi-squared is as follows. It peaks over here, somewhere just shy of 20, and it tapers off, and it's got a variance that turns out to be twice new. In other words, a width here that's roughly going to be about root 2 times root 20, uh, give or take. That's in the neighborhood of about uh, 6 or 7. And if you've done what we call a good fit, if you've chosen your A's properly using the pseudo-inversion technique, if you have chosen a model that is appropriate for the data, in other words, if, if your data is supposed to follow a sinusoid, you've chosen a sinusoid. And if the sigma values that you use here are pretty accurate, reasonably accurate, you'll find out that your chi-squared value will fall somewhere around in this area and with a standard deviation of square root of 2 nu. Now, why is this important? It's important because when you do a data fit, when you take measured data, come up with a model, and find these parameters, it's really incumbent upon you to ask yourself, have I done a good job? Have I come up with a good model? Have I estimated my errors properly? And the answer will be in calculating chi-squared and finding out how close it falls to where you expect it to be. And remember, the expected value of chi-squared is equal to this number of degrees of freedom, nu. And the deviation you expect from it is going to be roughly square root of 2 square root of, of nu. So in my little example here, let's say I have 25 data points, and I have five unknown coefficients in my model. I do my linear modeling. I calculate using pseudo-inversion my values of A. I go back and I calculate chi-squared. Real easy to do, by the way. This is also one line of code, as I'll show you. And let's say I get a chi-squared that comes out to be, for the sake of argument, 20. I look over here. That's pretty close to the peak. I've done a good job in fitting that data. On the other hand, let's say I chose a model that was exponential, where my data really should have followed a sinusoid. In that case, you can see here what's going to happen. The data minus the model probably is not going to fit to within the error of my measurement. I'm going to end up with values in here that are then squared and added up that are going to be a lot more than one for each of these values of n. 
what will happen is my chi squared will be way up here somewhere. In that case, it's a clear indication to me that I have not chosen the right model. I should have chosen signs, whereas instead I chose an exponential. It'll tell you, in other words, by looking at chi squared, whether you've got a model that makes sense for the problem and whether you've got values of sigma i that are correct. Question? What happens if you end up with a value that's below 20 in that example? Ah, oh, that's a very good point. Excellent point. If your value of chi squared is below, down here, for, for example, that's also certainly unexpected. And the only way that can happen is if the sigma i here was chosen to be too large. In other words, you made a way too conservative estimate of the error in your measurement system. That'll drive chi-squared down low. So, uh, good point. When chi-squared is high, you've done a bad fit. Something's wrong. You either have the wrong basis function set or your sigma i's are, are way too small. You're, you're too optimistic about your measurement system. But if your chi-squared becomes very low, in other words, it's equal to the mean here, minus root 2 nu, minus a little more, it's way too far low, then your sigma i's simply are, are too conservative. That's the only thing you can conclude from the problem. And that's an excellent conclusion, too. It causes you to go back and ask, does my measurement system really have better error than I think? So chi-squared goodness of fit and its PDF. This is a really useful concept. Use it all the time in measurement theory. Here's an example now. Let's go back to where we have this pair of basis functions, sine and exponential. m is equal to 2. We have two unknowns in the problem. Our model is the sum of aj times xj of xi. So it's a model right here. Here's our unknown coefficient multiplying the sine. There's our unknown coefficient multiplying the exponential. Here's our design matrix for the problem. Just repeating that same slide. Let's put this now to the test. Let's actually go to MATLAB and show how we would use this. What I'm going to do is set up here a, a set of abscissa values that run from 0 to pi. And there'll be 101 of them. Uh, let's see. So n in this case, actually n should be 101. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. n should be 101. That won't make too big of a difference. But in any case, I've got about 100 abscissa values. And let's say that the coefficients here that I'm going to use to generate a pseudo-random set are 1 and 0.1. These are the true values, in other words, that underlie the pseudo-random data I'm going to generate. I'll then try to estimate these values using least squares fitting. I'm going to make sure that though um, I'm simulating a real measurement system, I'm going to add noise to the measurements of this data. And so I'll construct the data that I measure as follows. It'll be a1, which is 1 times sine of x. It'll be 100 or 101 numbers, plus a2 which is 0.1 times e to the x, plus sigma, which is a half times a random set of normally distributed variables that are of the size of x. This is my random data, and I plot it down here. These little circles are exactly that random data. Now, if you didn't see these lines over here and you looked at that data, it's kind of hard to really determine whether it follows a polynomial or a sign or an exponent relationship, an exponential relationship. It's really impossible to say. So in some regards, I'm going to imagine that I'm using the physics of what I think is going on to suggest that I have here a model which consists of a sign and an exponential. And here is the design matrix. It's literally one line of code. x is a tall vector of points. It's 101 tall by one column. And my design matrix here is constructed literally just by taking the sign of that column and putting it next to the exponent of that column. One line of code. 
Now, what are the, the fit variables? A fit is equal to the inverse of A transpose times A times A transpose times Y. One line of code gives me the, the two coefficients that are the least squares error modeling coefficients, best modeling coefficients, in other words, for this data. Now, how do I construct the actual model of this data after I have come up with my A coefficients? Very easy. I take my design matrix. I multiply it by my fit coefficients. So this fit coefficient vector is really a vector that has two columns, one row, two numbers in it. Multiply it by A, and that's equal to my, my fit vector. How do I calculate chi-squared? Again, one line of code. I take my fit values, subtract the actual data, the pseudo-random data I used to, uh, to come up with uh, my measured data over here. I square that. I sum it. And, oh, by the way, I want to come up with a chi-squared value, so I divide it by sigma squared as well. In this case, the sigma happened to be the same for each data point. The noise, the measurement error, in other words, was the same for each data point. So all I needed to do is divide by a scalar. But if you happen to have some knowledge that your measurement error was different from point to point, then the sigma could easily be a vector, in which case you divide through by the sigma that's associated with each one of the, the entries in the y values. And then you'd sum things up. But again, one line of code. This produces for you the well-established classical chi-squared variable for the problem. Now, let's take a look at the results. The blue circles are the actual data points. The actual model which is going to be A1 times sine plus A2 times the exponent, uh, irrespective of the noise. The actual model is the green curve. The fit to this is the red curve, and you can see that it matches the green curve pretty well. Not too bad. But when I say not too bad, that's pretty subjective. How do you really put a number on it? Well, that's what chi-squared is for. If I calculate chi-squared for this, it ends up being 101.39, which is very close to the number of degrees of freedom. The number of degrees of freedom, strictly speaking, is 101 minus 2, which is 99. So there, that chi-squared is well within square root 2, square root nu of what it should be, which is 99. Therefore, I have a good fit. It's the best I can do with the data, quite frankly. If chi-squared here turned out to be, let's say, 200, would that be a good fit? Well, what's the square root of 2 times the square root of nu here? So nu, remember, is 99. That's going to be n minus m. Square root of 99, that's about 10, give or take. Multiply that by the square root of 2, and I've got about 14. So if the chi-squared value turned out to be 200, I couldn't call this a good fit. If it turned out to be 114, give or take, well, 113, it would be right on the edge of calling it a good fit, etc. So it's a real valuable, uh, not a subjective, but a very quantitative means of determining whether you've done a good job in, in your linear model fit. Note that the A coefficients here, too, come out pretty nice. A is very near 1, and, uh, I'm sorry, A of 1, rather. The first one is very near 1. Uh, the second coefficient is very near 0.1. Those are the A fit values. What if we have complex data? In electrical engineering, we oftentimes have complex data. We have vectors that describe the magnitude and the phase of some signal. We can come up with models. For example, we could come up with the transfer function of a linear system that produces complex output 
And we can ask ourselves, does the measured value of a system compare with the model of it, considering, indeed, the data would be complex? Well, it turns out that extending this and coming up with a chi-squared for complex data is very simple. Rather than squaring the difference between the data and the model, you take the magnitude squared of the difference between the data and the model. In this case, the model could consist of basis functions that are themselves complex. This x sub j, for example, could be e to the minus jxi, or e to the minus, uh, uh, thinking of the j here in terms of the square root of minus 1. It could be e to the minus i xi. It could be itself, in other words, a complex function. The sigma is, again, the measurement error that you think you have. And the design matrix is very easily set up, hardly any different. The way you find the optimal coefficients of the fit is, rather than multiplying by a transpose, we multiply by a Hermitian transpose. And the Hermitian transpose is the transpose of the matrix and the complex conjugate of it. Other than that, we do the same pseudo-inversion. It's just that inside these matrices are complex numbers rather than real numbers. The matrix B as well, which is the scaled version of the data, it's, it's Y divided by sigma, that's also a complex number, or complex vector, I should say. So we've gone from taking observed data, which could be modeled by transcendental functions, polynomials, really even integral differential functions, as long as the model is linear. The error on each one of those measurements could be different, and the data itself could be complex. As long as our number of measurements was greater than the number of coefficients, we found here very easy ways, little, literally one line of code solutions for getting the optimal fit coefficients. What if n is less than m? What if you don't have enough measurements, in other words? Well, there are still ways of going about using these constructs for coming up with solutions. And they have to do with the use of what we call singular value decomposition. Now, singular value decomposition is something I want to spend a few minutes on, so I'm going to stop right here, and we're going to pick up next time. We're going to talk about SVD and how it relates to least squares inversion, and we'll see how we can use SVD to get a best estimate of your A coefficients, your model coefficients, even in the case where the number of data points is less than the number of model coefficients. And we'll talk about that next time.